Okay. Hello, my name is Luke Jennings. I'm VP of R&D at Push Security, and I'm here to talk to you about info stealers today. So how attackers are stealing your cookies to bypass MFA. So as a quick agenda, what we're going to look at, we're going to go through the background quickly. Uh, so understanding why there's been a rise of info stealers. Uh, we'll consider why info stealers are a problem, who they're a problem for. Uh, we'll sort of compare them briefly to other common initial access methods, and then we'll jump into the demo. So we're gonna kind of see how info stealers work under the hood. Um, and we're gonna have a real focus on session hijacking through stolen session cookies. So we're gonna see how you can compromise things like Microsoft Entra by doing that, but we're also gonna look at compromising some downstream uh, SaaS apps that will be um, guarded by an IDP like uh, Entra or Okta. Uh, and we'll also look at bypassing some common controls like location-based controls uh, for things like conditional access policies that you might apply. Finally, we'll just have a look at how, you know, some of the things we're doing at Push to help, help uh, deal with this problem. Okay, so first point is, why is everyone talking about info stillers now? Um, so the reason for this really is because of the recent Snowflake compromises. So info stillers are not new as such, but they've really uh, garnered a lot of attention recently due to the Snowflake breaches. And the reason for that is that it was discovered by Mandiant that 80% of the stolen accounts that were used uh, in the victim Snowflake tenants were actually originally stolen uh, via info stealer breaches. And they actually dated back in many cases to, to uh, 2020. So these credentials were stolen a long time ago, uh, had never been changed. And I guess attackers until recently had not realized that these credentials were valid on Snowflake instances. And at a certain point that was discovered and that led to this huge, huge breach. Um, and for that reason, info stealers have kind of come into the limelight a little bit more again, as we've seen just what a threat they can they can pose even years after the fact. So let's consider some numbers here. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of different research out there by different parties that have looked into this. So I've sort of brought together some key stats here that are pretty interesting. So like from IBM, they've said uh, they've seen like a 266% increase in uh, last year in 2023 uh, for info stealer activity, uh, while valid cred use was up 71%. Um, Flare said they got 1 million new steel logs every month. And this, you know, this doesn't just affect personal accounts. They're saying that they see up to 5% containing uh, legitimate corporate credentials as well. Softwares have said like stealers, loggers, and other types of spyware in these kind of wider families make up nearly half of their malware detections now. Um, Verizon said like over a thousand credentials appear online every day. Uh, and most of the time that's actually just within a day of them being stolen. So it's, the turnaround is pretty quick. Uh, and then when we think about things like um, session cookie theft, some of the other things we're gonna look at later, uh, Microsoft has said uh, there were 147,000 token replay attacks detected in 2023. And that was an over doubling of the year bef uh, before that. So we've seen clearly a big rise in that type of attack technique. Uh, and finally, Google has said that now attacks on session cookies are happening at the same magnitude from their researchers as password attacks too. So we've seen this big shift to session cookie theft and general session hijacking as well. Uh, we'll see a little bit about why that is later. Okay, so what's the 101 info stealers? What are they? Um, essentially, they're just a type of malware. Uh, but they're a type of malware that steals data from the, the, the infected device. So there are many different families out there and there's a lot of commonality between them. So I'm gonna sort of divide that into two streams. So I'm gonna say almost all stealers will have a smash and grab component. So once they're launched on the system and the system is infected, they will extract info from browsers. That will generally be passwords, cookies, autofill data, maybe downloaded files, crypto wallets if they're available, anything that might be of interest. Uh, they'll then be a little bit of a snapshot of the system. So they may take with that, you know, the system name, username, location data, hardware data, various other things to identify where that data came from. And then that will be combined and it will be sent back to some sort of C2 server, usually just in a fairly simple file format. And that's something we see with most malware uh, or infosteader families. 
is, is that smash and grab technique. Now, what we see with some other uh, Steelers that may be slightly more advanced uh, capabilities are then ongoing capabilities beyond that. So some of them will continue to key log and send data over time. So they might intercept passwords as they are used. And uh, you know that may uncover new passwords for attackers that weren't available as uh, saved passwords in a, a browser password manager, for example, on the first smash and grab instance. So they may get new data that way. Um, they may also target specific apps. So that could be things like you know password managers or remote desktop apps. So again, gathering more credentials that might not have been um, available on first run. Uh, and sometimes they may actually just provide a capability to load additional malware in future if needed. So maybe they act as a, a ransomware dropper in future or something. So there are more capabilities out there in some other families. Um, but the most common functionality is very much the initial smash and grab, which is common to most of them. So what's the path to infection? Um, well, InfoStillers are distributed in the same way as any other malware really. So this isn't something that's a new part of them. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about typical malware infection methods that have been pretty common for a long time now. So we'll generally talk about a victim being lured to access a malicious site. Uh, perhaps that's been distributed via a link, via email, maybe some social messaging, maybe content sharing platforms, something along those lines. Um, but the end result is that a victim runs some sort of malicious code in some way on their machine. Um, so that will then re result in an effective machine and then the info stealer code will be running. And as we saw before, obviously, most of the functionality is pretty immediate and, you know, an initial smash and grab, uh, and then the malware will steal the data. So it will exfil it via, um, C2. So it may, you know, make a, an FTP upload or an HTTP upload or something to some external command and control server, uh, to, to send that information back. So that's pretty much the path to infection. There isn't much new there. It's the kind of things you'll be familiar with from from normal generic kind of malware infection methods. So what are some common misconceptions we come over in this space? Um, so one thing we've seen is that like in the past, a lot of info stealers were quite focused on, on personal accounts often. Um, so more consumer orientated and maybe less focused on corporate targets. Um, that's not really the case anymore. Uh, they aren't just a problem for personal devices. So, you know, some of the things we've seen before is people thinking, oh, it's okay, I've got, you know, AV and EDR, that's going to be okay. Um, we can deal with that. Obviously, just like with anything, you know, EDR and AV, they it can be bypassed. It's not a perfect control. So you can get info stealers on corporate devices. Um, but actually, some of the more interesting ways we often see uh, corporate vulnerability exposed for info stealers is in these sort of the murkier territories where we have things like um, third party contractors, maybe they're using less secure devices uh, that might be for multi client use or including personal use and they may do some work. So then they might not be subject to controls uh, or security controls for an organization in the same way that permanent employees might be. And that may be a weakness and then they have the credentials they've been uh, given for their role within an organization stolen, maybe for multiple organizations at the same time, if they are contracting to multiple customers. Um, but another interesting thing is, is browser profiles, um, cause they can be synced across multiple devices. And one issue we see here sometimes is that let's say someone's using a, you know, a nice locked down corporate device and Chrome is their default, uh, browser, but the corporate you know, customer isn't, a, they're not a Google customer as such. They're just using Chrome as the, as the browser. And then that employee also wants to access their Gmail or their Google photos or whatever, you know, while they're working. So they sign into their Google account as a personal thing too. Now, often they'll end up signing into Chrome as that account. And then they can use Chrome password manager through that. And they can, you know, there's the ability to sync profiles with their personal profile. Many people will do that because that makes life easy for them. Uh, the problem is then when they start using that to save their corporate credentials as well, because it's easy and it works and you know, it's a nice, easy password manager, but then the corporate, uh, machine doesn't need to be compromised. It could be their personal device that gets compromised that has no additional security controls. And because of the syncing, their 
you know, you might then have corporate credentials exposed via Chrome Password Manager. That's like an example, but I think we, we you know, this is this is happening more now where you get this sort of blurry line between what's personal and what's corporate. Um, and the other aspect is that, you know, a, a lot of the distribution methods that, uh, for info stealers have often been more consumer orientated in the past, um, particularly things like gaming forums and s sort of consumer orientated social media. But we're seeing, you know, increasing use of more corporate platforms like GitHub, for example, um, as spreading mechanisms here. So they, they are increasing amounts of focus going on on corporate targets too. So that's just some of the common misconceptions. So moving on now, we're going to look at sort of credentials and cookies. And a lot of the focus we're going to uh, have for the rest of this webinar is going to be on the sort of cookies and the session theft side. So traditionally, info stealers stole credentials, more password focused theft. Um, what's changed now though, is that because a lot of different services use MFA now, and particularly in the corporate world, often your major identity providers like your Microsoft Entras and your Octas and so forth, uh, are highly likely to be MFA enabled. Um, stealing credentials alone doesn't necessarily get you what you want as an attacker. Uh, you know, you can't steal the MFA method at the same time. So you've only got half the picture and then you might also be subject to other restrictions like location restrictions, for example, for logins and maybe other controls. So what's happened as movement here is that session cookies have become arguably the more valuable prize because they are a way of often bypassing MFA. So instead of stealing the passwords, you steal the valid session cookies from the device and then you import them into a different browser and then you resume the session and you access their authenticated session. You don't need to re-authenticate. And by doing that, you effectively bypass MFA, you bypass SSO, uh, and you've got something that's pretty powerful as an attacker there. Um, you might be limited by session lifetime, but often sessions uh, are either valid for quite a long time, or if you maintain activity in them, they sometimes will be maintained indefinitely. And the other thing is there's often ways of maintaining persistence once you've got uh, an account. So there's a whole bunch of things you can do to maintain persistence to an account once you've got temporary access. So you can often get around those limitations as an attacker too. So that's why cookies become um, so valuable now, uh, because they can be used to bypass MFA. So I said we compare with other initial access methods. And what I'm thinking of here as a primary thing to compare to would be phishing particularly what I would call phishing 2.0. And that is really phishing evolved to target the same goal of bypassing MFA, which is typically achieved through the use of attacker in the middle toolkits or browser in the middle toolkits. Um, so the idea with these is that they, they both steal credentials, info stealers and phishing, they, they steal credentials. Um, and then modern variants also steal cookies and sessions. Uh, so what's the difference? With phishing, it's likely to be more targeted. Uh, you know, you've got to send a phishing link to a particular user that needs to emulate a particular app and capture a certain set of credentials for that. Uh, and the, you know, one other thing is that you, you essentially event, you know, evade endpoint controls entirely because you're not needing to have any sort of malware compromise on the, on the device. Um, so, you know, maybe you as an attacker emulate Microsoft Entra and, and perform a sort of attacker in the middle phishing kit there and hijack their session. Uh, info stealers, on the other hand, uh, will tend to be less targeted, more opportunistic. So it tends to be more of a, a smash and grab as we saw earlier. So you can sort of push out those malware links all over the place, see what gets compromised, harvest everything you can from the device, all the different credentials and cookies and so forth send it back to your command and control server, and then you figure out what you do with that later. So it could lead to more targeted uh, attacks later if someone then realizes that they've got access to some particularly juicy credentials or cookies, then it can become targeted later. Um, but the initial part tends to be a lot more sort of spread out as far as possible and opportunistic. Um, the other difference is it does involve an endpoint compromise. So obviously it's more likely to be stopped by security controls on the endpoint, uh, whereas phishing won't necessarily be affected by that. So what we're talking about here, we're talking about different methods with the same objective. Basically they're both aimed at 
performing an account takeover. So their identity tax at the end of the day, they want to take over an account. Um, so we've got a few phases and there's a lot of similarity here. You know, phase one is the actual attack where it's either phishing or it's info stealing malware. That leads to stolen credentials and stolen cookies. And they can be used in different ways. So for phase three, you know, if you've stolen valid credentials, uh, if that, you know, if the account in question doesn't have MFA, then there you go. You can access that account straight away. On the other hand, if it does have MFA and you've stolen authenticated session cookies, then you may be able to perform a session hijacking attack. And that can be done both with attacker in the middle phishing and info stealer malware. Or the alternative is it, with your sort of password based credentials, maybe the account you compromised uh, has MFA, but maybe the same username and password or a similar username with that same password is valid for different applications, different SaaS apps out there where MFA hasn't been configured. So you might be able to perform credential stuffing attacks to sweep across lots of different services and uncover other accounts. But that's the kind of the process and all of those things, uh, whatever route you take leads to account takeover. So then finally, um, what's the journey of an info stealer log? So as said, for an info stealer, we will send up the data that's been compromised to a command control server somewhere. Typically, what happens then is that sort of enters the criminal underworld, so to speak, and they will figure out what they want to do with that. They might use that privately. They might sell that data on private channels, like pirate telegram channels to, to other bidders. Um, they may sell it on public channels. Um, so you've got this kind of uh, sort of mix of different operators here and different ways that credentials can uh, be used and journeys they can take. So maybe you've got multiple victims, maybe some of them have uh, been compromised with standard generic commercial info stealers that are just smashing, grabbing everything they can get their hands on. Uh, maybe that goes to, you know, some sort of criminal operators and they distribute that via private and public channels. Some of those might lead to opportunistic attacks. On the other hand, you might have a state sponsored operator that finds credentials they're interested in on those channels, buys them and turns it into a targeted attack. Or alternatively, those state sponsored actors may even have their own private stealers out there that are being used in a more targeted way to gather credentials they're looking for. So there's really a big mix of completely open kind of opportunistic generic attacks down to quite targeted attacks. And there's a real sort of murky blurred line between how those things occur with, with info stealers. Okay, so that's all the background. We're gonna move on to the demo side now. So we're gonna go through a few different demos. Uh, what I wanna do now is show the behavior of an info stealer effectively after it's been downloaded and executed. So I'm not, I'm not gonna show you sort of, you know, the malware delivery mechanism and, and, and running a malicious piece of code as such. Um, I'm gonna say, you know, this machine I'm gonna demo on it's been compromised and then I'm going to show you the individual components uh, of how an info stealer works and we'll, we'll show sort of some, some session hijacking attacks being uh, conducted using stolen cookies. So I'm going to focus more on the actual mechanisms to show how it works rather than utilizing a criminal piece of, of, of an info stealer. So we're going to have the creds and session tokens effectively stolen from the browser. Uh, you know, the data would then be sent back to the attacker's machine. I'll just show, I'm going to be copying and pasting some data in this case from as output from a tool. Uh, and then I'll show you on my sort of attacker machine on a different browser using a, a browser extension to import the cookies. Uh, and then I'll show some ways of uh, circumventing IP locking controls as well and how we can use that to resume stolen sessions. So what I'm going to use here is uh, I'm actually going to use an open source uh, effectively info stealer. So it's a standalone executable called hack browser data. So I'm going to, I'm going to use that to simulate info stealer behavior, um, combine that with a Python script just to change the format of the data. And then I'll be using uh, a browser extension called cookie editor as the importer. So all these things are actually freely available. If you want to test this yourself, um, rather than me showing you, uh, a criminal piece of info stealer, that's just going to run invisibly in the background, send some data, off to an external location uh, and I won't be able to show you the other mechanisms. So this is how I'm going to demonstrate it. I'm going to start off by stealing an entry session as our first example. So I've got a video here. 
All right, so on the left is my victim machine. So we're going to, this is what, what we're going to be assuming is the compromised machine. I'm just going to log into Entra with MFA, first of all, to show you that happening. So I'm just going to use the Microsoft Authenticator app now uh, and log into that. Okay, so now I'm, I'm logged in. Uh, so you can see I'm logged into Office. Okay, there we go. I'm in Chrome. This is my victim machine. Okay, so at this point, I'm just going to close Chrome and we'll assume it's compromised. I'm going to be doing everything manually from the command shell here just to show you the mechanisms by which this occurs. So I'm going to run Hack Browser data. I'm just going to show you the basic data it pulls back, like the kind of things are available first. So, okay, look, we can get passwords out if we want. In this case, I've only saved one password, but um, you can see how I've saved the password for my Entra account. So I could steal that. But as we've seen, we're using uh, MFA, and as such, you know, I wouldn't be able to use that as an attacker on my own. But there are a whole bunch of cookies as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to output it in a different format. I used CSV before just because it's easy to show. I'm going to output it in JSON format instead, and I'm going to use a, a Python script just to transform that data uh, into a slightly different format that is correct to use with a... Um, uh, with the, the browser extension I'm going to show you in a sec. I just want to show you here quickly, I'm connected, I'm just using a VPN to sort of show location-based things. In this case, I'm, I'm connected from the USA. Um, we'll come to you know this later when we look at location controls. But right now, I'm just going to copy all those cookies and I'm going to go to my attacker machine. I've got a Firefox instance here with cookie editor running. And I'm going to import all those cookies that we've just stolen from the other machine. And then what happens is I'm going to try and access Office now. And you can see there, it's transparently re-logged in and resumed a session, and I'm now uh, compromised um, the Office session. So it really is as simple as that. Uh, now, if I move on to the second demo, we're gonna kind of see that again, uh, but we're gonna consider how things like conditional access policies or other you know, restrictions on logins might impact things if you're dealing with something non-Microsoft. Uh, I'm going to use conditional access policies from Microsoft here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume here that it's been set up so that uh, logins can only occur from, a, from certain countries where the user is intended to work from. Uh, and that if an attacker located in a completely different part of the world steals this and tries to access it, um, you know, or at least you know, if they had credentials to log in, that they shouldn't be able to log in from those locations. So. And just to show again, you know, I'm connected from the US on my victim machine. That's a leg legitimate connection. Whereas my attacker machine is coming from a completely different part of the world. So I'm going to do the same thing I did again. I'm going to import these cookies and we're going to see what happens. Now, in Microsoft's case, the way their sessions often work is that if they detect any change, there's a, a re-authentication event. But the, authentic the cookies are persistent to re-allow authentication unless there's some additional control. So here it's essentially try to transparently re-authenticate, like the user wouldn't normally see anything, but we've actually come back with an error here saying you can't access this right now. It doesn't say specifically to the attacker here, but it obviously gives you an indication that it, um, it's some sort of restriction, probably it says browser app or location based. In this case, I'm, I'm telling you now, this is because of the location. So we said before, uh, you know, often info stealers will take information from the endpoint itself about, you know, not just the passwords and the cookies, but like system names and location data and other things. So if I was an attacker, I'd say, okay, where did these credentials come from? And I'd, I'd say, okay, look, it came from a machine that was uh, in Miami, US in the example that I was connected. Maybe I can use residential VPNs to do the same thing and see if that works now. So this is going to happen. This is on my host machine, so I can't. You can't see this right now on the video, but off screen, I'm just using the same VPN you saw previously to connect myself to the same uh, vague location of, of, of Miami, US. And then all I need to do is just refresh. Didn't even need to do anything else. Didn't need to re-import anything. And then there you go. I'm in. So it can be as simple as that. Um, and that's if. Uh, location policies even get applied on session stealing. For some apps, it won't even check this again. Microsoft is a little bit of a different case where it re-performed those checks. But you have to understand often if, if things are quite coarse based on location data like that, 
often that information will be available to an attacker anyway. And with res residential VPNs existing all around the world now, they can genuinely, uh, generally shift their IP to, to fit in with this. So unless you've got very tight controls that say, I don't know, maybe it has to come from an IP range for your particular office, that's obviously a stronger, a much stronger control. But if it's general location based controls, then often someone with an info stealer may be able to just circumvent that. Okay. So now we're going to move on to another demo. Uh, and now we're going to consider the idea of downstream SAS application session theft. So I focused on the IDP level, looking at Microsoft Entra to begin with. That's obviously the juiciest target for anyone because that's your IDP. It's normally, normally controls access to some of the most important data you have, like email and often files. And then often that's then the gateway to any other system you access or, or rather a large portion of them via SSO and things like that. So it's obviously, you know, IDBs are obviously the juiciest target, but you have to consider that it's not the only target. Often uh, a lot of data will be on downstream apps. Even if access to them is controlled via the IDP, they have their own session management uh, approaches normally. And so you can independently still session, app, uh, session cookies from them. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, we're going to look at this again. Um, and I'm going to say, we've got conditional access policies restricting the location. And we'll say that, I don't know, we can't circumvent that for whatever reason. Maybe those IPs are really, really specific. So it's like quite a strong control, whatever the case is, we're just going to assume we can't steal the entry session, but let's say we're interested in, in this case, I don't know, Atlassian. I'm just using that as an example of a downstream app that someone might use. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show accessing it via SSO. So, um, I'm going to do a Microsoft login here. So this is going to be a social login form of SSO. So this is an OIDC login. Um, it's different to a SAML login, but it's still just another form of SSO. So I'm logging in with my Microsoft account, not with an Atlassian account. Uh, and now I'm logged in, which means there's an active session in my browser. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to show, uh, you know, the fact that I wouldn't be able to hijack the entry session. We're going to see how that differs if we want to access uh, Atlassian. So let's say I go back to Microsoft. I re-import these cookies again, and then I, I, I try to access it. And uh, what I find is that I've got this same message again. Okay, all right, can't get into that. Next best thing is let's try and access some downstream SAS apps. So I go to Atlassian and say, well, actually the data I'm interested in is all in these tickets and these stories and, and whatever wikis or, you know, in Atlassian. Uh, let's import the Atlassian cookies uh, and then see if that works. And there we go. You can see now I've hijacked the session for Atlassian. So it's exactly the same approach. Um, nothing really changes. Uh, but it's just to sort of make the point that you, you know, it's not just about protecting your IDP. Obviously that's the number one front, you know, number one control, like it's the front door, it's the gateway. You want to give that the most attention, but you do need to consider the fact that, uh, downstream SaaS applications can have their sessions stolen too, and they will generally not have the same level of security controls as you might see on an IDP. Okay. Finally, uh, I've been picking on, uh, Microsoft, <laughs> I just want to use a different example. So I'm going to just show another example, very similar thing, but with Okta. So I'm going to say, okay, let's say we can't compromise the Okta session for whatever reason, uh, as an example, can, you know, can we do the same thing and access downstream SAS applications from Okta? Um, I'm going to just use shortcut as a similar example here, uh, cause it's a similar, a similar product to, to, um, some of Atlassian's products. Uh, and I'm going to steal the sessions from a you know, from a, a shortcut SAS application that I've accessed using Okta, as we just saw, and then I'll perform the same uh, attack we saw previously. And again, I've hijacked the session for shortcut. So it's not just Microsoft, you know, uh, it's not just Atlassian. I just wanted to show you, you know, this affects everything pretty equally. You know, it affects Microsoft, it affects Okta, and it affects downstream SAS applications through multiple different SSO login mecha mechanisms. Um, it's a pretty general technique. Okay. So I've done most of the offensive side now. Uh, you know, uh, I just wanted to show a little bit of what we've been doing at push as a final thing. So we do, we have one control in our platform that we've put in place for our customers 
for protecting against session token theft. Uh, it's a pretty generic method, so I'm going to show you how it works uh, in the general sense, which is, is quite powerful if you want to customize it as a, as a customer. And then I'm going to show you the sort of easy integrations we've made uh, for Microsoft and Okta. I'll use Microsoft as an example here, uh, being the sort of most high value examples of it. So, um, I want to show you is, you know, this is our app uh, and this is our controls page. We've got lots of different controls in place. So I'm going to look at the session theft detection one here. And what happens is you have the ability to generate a new marker and you can see the marker is given there. Um, and then what happens is that marker will be added to the user agent for requests made to any of the domains that you choose to add down there. And separate to that, if you want to make this control work very easily uh, for Microsoft or for Okta, you can set up an integration with those and then we'll do the whole job of doing the detection for you. But I'm going to show you under the hood how the detection works first and then I'll show you the sort of easy version. Um, so you can configure the domains that will cause this marker to be sent in the user agent. And the idea is that if the session is stolen in some way uh, and it's a request is made from elsewhere, that marker won't be included by default because it won't exist. Uh, the push extension won't be there and thus you can detect theft by seeing uh, sessions be resumed elsewhere in backend logs without the marker present that we'd expect. So we've added a whole bunch of different uh, Microsoft domains here to make sure that it's sent for all those and we've made the Microsoft integration. So I'm going to show you the, uh, the detailed side where if you wanted to implement this yourself we will be sending that marker in the user agent from uh, from our browser extension for every user. Now, if you go and then look in the logs in Azure, uh, the Azure logs, um, you can see this marker has been added for the login. This, this is looking back at the, the demos I showed you before. This was the legitimate login that occurred from Chrome on the, on the Victor machine. You can see how that marker was present. On the other hand, if I look at the next login event that occurred uh, when I stole the session, you can see how, well also I've not done anything clever to try and impersonate a different browser. I was doing it from a whole different browser there, Firefox. So you can see straight away it's a bit weird because it came from Firefox, but principally there's no marker present. And so this is the idea. If you can see that a session was accessed again, but without a marker when previously it was seen with a marker, you can infer with a very high fidelity that that session has been stolen from elsewhere. So it's not just that the user, you know, the, 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 if it was just a user agent change or a different, you know, browser or whatever, it could be someone logged in from an unmanaged device or something. It may not be an actual malicious attack, but with what we've done, you can see that it genuinely was stolen. Now you can't see in those common Azure logs that that was definitely the same sessions. It's hard to tell that apart. It could just be someone just logging in legitimately, but from a different device. But actually with Microsoft uh, and with Okta and some other backends, you can often see more detail in via the API. Now I'm just going into Microsoft Compliance Manager to show you effectively the same login logs here that show you more data. You might not be familiar with this interface if you've only used Azure logs. But look at this session ID here. This is for the first login. Now you're not going to remember all of it. Just remember the first bit being 527. Uh, that is a legit login. And if we go up and we see the user agent again, you'll see this was the legit one that had the marker at the end. Um, whereas on the other hand, if we go to the malicious one, you'll see, okay, so this was the Firefox login. And then if we go down and it's not got the marker, and if we go down here, we look at the session ID, you can see the session ID was the same. It's like that 527 beginning. So this is how we infer with high fidelity that this session was stolen. So we say, this is not a new login. This is the resumption of an existing session on a different device without the push extension installed. Someone must have stolen the exact session cookie to do that. And so it's a much, much, much better indicator than just finding uh, a login from a different user agent or even just a login without the marker. So that's what we're looking for. You could make an integration to do that yourself. You know, our, our browser extension just provides the ability to send it. And so you can send that to any domain you want. If you've got a, a custom application that is important to you, you could send it to the domains where that's hosted. And if you've got backend uh, server logs like this, you could then implement your own detection. 
so that's why we've built a generic feature for that, so it can be used for anything. But for your common IDPs like Microsoft, like Okta, we've got the auto integrations. So if you do an integration in our app, um, what happens then is it'll do all the monitoring of the backend logs at the same time for you, and you'll get an event like this. So here you can say, hey, session theft was detected uh, of this account. And it's as simple as that. It appears in our events page. And if you've configured web hooks, it will be sent to your SIM. Uh, and then you can do whatever you want with it. So, you know, we make it as easy as possible for Microsoft and Okta. But the control itself is generic and it could even support your own custom applications if you wanted to do that. So that's what we're doing to help protect against this uh, issue with our product. Okay. So... Um, at that point, that pretty much concludes the, the webinar. So uh, hopefully that's been useful and we'll move on now to Q&A. Well, we've had loads of questions come in. So thank you very much for, for sending those in. Um, I'll start from the bottom. Um, so can attackers bypass MFA even with advanced mechanisms like hardware tokens, e.g. YubiKeys or biometric authentication? Yes. Um, so I think the, the point, point thing with like session theft is, is you're operating at a different layer to authentication. So it's, it's post authentication. So it doesn't matter whether the authentication mechanism necessarily was a, a weaker or stronger mechanism. If you steal the valid session, there's nothing that occurs that forces reauthentication to occur then you can still still the session so it's it's really you know it's two it's two layers i think where the line gets blurred slightly is where you know some some platforms may have mechanisms where they think there's been a slight change that's occurred in some way you know maybe because the ip has changed or something and they may decide to prompt for reauth um that's where the sort of line gets a little bit blurry but in principle no it doesn't matter whether you're using a strong hardware authentication mechanism or, or even a single factor password, it's a set, that's a separate layer and mechanism from the session. And so if you still the session, once authentication is valid, then that session is still valid. Great. Thanks. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, do info stealers also affect mobile phones? So this one, actually, I'm not as familiar with mobile malware. Um, so I'm not 100% sure on that off the top of my head. I mean, what I do know, mobile, like, mobile phones tend to have, uh, or mobile OSs at least, tend to be more secure in terms of compartmentalization of data than desktop OSs. So it's often harder, even if you get something running, to have full access to lots of other apps and things. So uh, it, it definitely won't be as easy on desktop, but I'm, I, I can't really say much more than that because I'm just much less familiar with, with mobile malware ecosystems. Okay. Um, next question. How can credentials stored in browsers be stolen if they are supposedly protected or encrypted? Okay, yeah, this is a good one. Um, what it comes down to is encryption is only really effective when, if you're talking about, say, something that's stored, like encryption of data at rest. You know, in, in the classic case of like, say your whole laptop, it's only really effective when your laptop is powered off. When, when it's powered on, your, you know, the system needs some way to access that data. And it's similar with things like password managers that run on a desktop or, you know, or within a browser. Because you're using the system actively at the time, the system needs to be able to gain access to those. Um, and, and malware can take advantage of that. So, you know, if you think of a simple case, let's say I wanted you used the KeyPass app and I wanted to steal from that, that's, that's a file that's encrypted on disk. And when KeyPass is not running, then that's, that's well protected. But when you run KeyPass and you open it, it's then accessible in memory and decrypted. Um, and so there's an avenue to get to it. It's a similar thing with browsers. There, there is a sort of cat and mouse game going on to try and make this more difficult. Uh, like there have been some changes recently uh, with regard to trying to make it so that only the process, the browser process itself can talk to the APIs to decrypt passwords. But then, you know, that means malware can inject into a browser process and then operate as if they are the browser process. It gives more opportunities for things like EDR to detect it, to detect that sort of 
uh, injection to memory and so forth. So, you know, there's a classic cat and mouse game going on, but I think ultimately it's because you're using the system and in many cases you need to, uh, th those passwords need to be decrypted. That's where the avenues are. So, um, you know, even if you need to put your, like on my Mac, I have to make a, a fingerprint to unlock my passwords in Chrome, but I don't have to do that every single time. Once I do it, that they're accessible on the system for a while until it prompts for real. So that's really why it happens. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's very difficult to like 100% protect passwords when you've got some malware running in the same context as you at the same time. Cool. Um, next question, uh, can a browser extension be used as an info stealer and how is it going to work? <laughs> um, that's quite, yeah, that is a good question. And the answer actually really is yes. Um, if you, well, browser extensions have quite a fine grained permission model. Um, but yeah, I mean, depending on what permissions are requested, like, yes, ultimately you can you can run a script on every single page, for example, your own custom JavaScript from an extension. Um, and you could use that to, to harvest passwords. Um, I mean, like, you know, in, in push, obviously a different use case, we, we see passwords going into websites for providing password protection controls through our extension. But if you were an attacker making a, a malicious extension and trying to distribute that in some way, you could do a similar, you know, perform a similar technique. So, so yes, um, they, you would then rely on more on waiting for users to enter their passwords into places and intercepting them as they are used. That would be more than the obvious model to follow as an attacker for an extension. Uh, but yeah, in principle, you know, you could use them as a mechanism. Great. Um, or not great. Uh, <laughs> uh, next question. Um, is it possible to stop the attacker using the stolen cookies if you enable WHFB with pin code on your computer? Okay, Windows Hello for Business. Um, I So I haven't tested a full complete Windows Hello for Business setup because that's the, the whole domain setup and all the rest of it. I have used uh, effectively Windows Hello, like pass keys with um, enter accounts. Uh, I don't want to say a hundred percent what the answer is on this just because I haven't tested a full complete setup. So I'll give you what I think the answer is with that caveat. Um, I think the answer is no, it won't stop stolen cookies, um, which comes back to one of the answers I gave to the previous questions of, you know, using the, the token and the pin code there, the winners hello and the, the pin code, that's an authentication mechanism. So once you've authenticated, if the session is then valid. So if you steal the session, uh, that's, you know, that's a separate layer again. So it will, it will come down to whether a forced reauthentication attempt, um, is, is, is given, uh, and even and with Entra, there's, there's really two layers of that. Like I I've spoken about this in the demos earlier, like when I, I showed a reauth occurring that caused conditional access policies to kick in, but as you see, I still wasn't prompted for a username and password on an MFA again because I had a persistent authentication cookie that had been set to remember my login, but it was at least uh, rechecking some of the conditional access policies controls at that point. So that's almost like a middle layer. Um, so you might get that, but uh, I would be surprised depending on your configuration, if it would go all the way back to a full reel. So, so I don't think Windows Hello for Business will solve this on its own, but I have to caveat with that as being something I haven't done a full test of. Cool. Um, I can answer this one. Will the recording be made available? Yes, you'll receive a copy uh, delivered to your inbox. Uh, that was an easy one. Um, okay, next question for you, Luke. Uh, in your demo, did you have CA token require protection for sign-in sessions activated? Uh, so I'm, this is the new in preview feature for token protection, uh, if I'm getting that right. Um, so no, if that's the one I'm thinking of, that's the one that's tying in with um, protection, like hardware protection for accessing tokens. I haven't used that feature yet. It's still in preview if it's the thing I'm thinking of. Um, that will be additional protection uh, on this, but I didn't have those preview features enabled doing this, no. Would that only affect like the IDP layer as well, not the sort of downstream apps? So, yeah, so that would be, so this is kind of coming into um, like device bound sessions more generally. 
coming in the future, which I didn't really speak to before. Um, the idea with that is to protect sessions so that they're not one fixed value that's accessible that can be stolen, that it's something that you have to like talk to the hardware and continually get new, uh, new values for so that um, there are, you know, effectively any one value you use at one time is extremely short lived, um, forcing you to stay on the endpoint. Google are doing similar things. Uh, so that's designed to provide a much stronger layer of protection against this. If you have the, you know, if you've got the, the right hardware, everything set up, but as I say, like these things are only in preview at the moment. And this is for the sort of like, in that case for the entry layer, um, that doesn't mean that that will operate for then the other apps. So I think, you know, we're, we're not even in the case where the IDPs are using this as a sort of default mechanism yet. Um, I think if you were thinking about this control more generally going into the future, protecting against this problem across lots of apps, I think if, if it's ever solved at all, it's going to be years and years away. Um, you know, for having more general apps using these mechanisms, we've been using the same web session management technique for decades. Uh, I don't think that's going to change significantly overnight, but it, it may be that in the next year or two, we see much better protections starting to become more common at the major IDP level, but yeah, that won't necessarily stop stealing all those downstream SAS app sessions, even if that does occur. Cool. Um, I think I'm going to have to start rattling through some of these and uh, maybe disappoint a few people and not answer their questions, I'm afraid, because we are running out of time. Um, but next one, um, to limit session cookies being hijacked, is it recommended to sign out of, a, of the application when it's no longer being used? Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it does reduce the window. Um, and if you're configuring apps or, or even, you know, if it's, you're writing apps like internal apps for use, you know, having a shorter session timeouts can help with that. Um, I mean, it's a classic problem though, in that, you know, if it, it causes users issues, if things are constantly signed out and they've got a, you know, if it's tied in with SSO nicely, then it's not as bad as it will, you know, cause a reauth. but yeah, I mean, limiting session, um, lifetime in some way is, is definitely useful for at least limiting the exposure here. Cool. Um, can you provide a list of common URLs, which can be used in the session theft detection for the likes of Microsoft? Yes, uh, I don't have to the hand, but, um, in terms of like what we configure for push, it might even be in our docs. I'd have to, we'll have to come back on that one, but we, we can definitely give a list cause we've, we've configured this before. Great. Um, okay. To resolve this threat, we're looking at introducing a conditional access rule to only allow access to our Azure apps from company owned devices. Is this still an avenue we should pursue in your experience? Uh, I think the devil in the, is in the detail of the, the setup. I think the, the problem we speak to some of these questions is that conditional access policies and enter and uh, active directory and that are so highly configurable that I don't want to give a one size fits all answer to, to things like this. Um, what it might be worth considering, I mean, it's definitely a good thing. What you're suggesting is a good thing to do. What I can't tell you is whether it's going to be, you know, a, a perfect solution to, to some of these things. It depends how, um, it operates. Um, what I would say is like, if you've got security assessment exercises, pen testers, whether it's internal or external, or whatever, looking at this, then, you know, bring these up in the scope, have, you know, test these things out. Um, and in fact, if you just want to do basic tests for this, if you see the, the extension I used, I edit this cookie, um, you don't have to use hack browser data and all the others. I wanted to show it a little bit more realistically as attack, but if you just want to import and export cookies from one browser to another, you can test that really easily just with that extension yourself. So you could set it up in the lab environment, apply it to your users or whatever, and try that and then export the cookies from the. Uh, from the device that, that is the well-protected one, import them into a browser on another system and at least do a basic test like that. Um, so that'd be worth considering as well. Great. Thanks. Um, okay. I think this one is going to be another, it depends, but, um, do you think that current next gen antivirus and XDR solutions are effective in blocking info stealer malware? Uh, I mean, I haven't used. I mean, I used to make a, I used to design a EDR product 
uh, in my past life, but I haven't used EDR Ango in, in more recent years. And I don't think they're going to have a 100% solution to this, like there never really has been. Um, so, you know, I think it's just going to be classic endpoint malware, cat and mouse, you know, they'll, they'll provide a layer of protection, but there'll always be something new that's designed to get around it. So I don't think we're going to see a 100% uh, protection against this sort of thing. Okay. Um, I think this will be the last one, but um, can a rule be made where multiple logins with the same session IDs and attributes, like location, um, being different, be marked as session theft? Do you follow what that is? Uh, I think this might be um, relating to our, our product potentially. So could you in theory make a rule where if there are multiple logins with um, S session IDs and, and locations being different be marked. I mean, that is, that is our, that is our control, isn't it? To an extent, um, we're effectively providing a mechanism to do that. Um, what well, say we, yeah, we do it in a, in a different way with a marker, which makes it much more reliable. Mm -hmm. but the question here is around location. Um, so we don't do it based on location. We do it based on marker so that we don't have to worry about location changes. Uh, in terms of whether you can do anything like this with Entra, for example, uh, I'm not sure, but what I would say is that location changes aren't always, they're not a very reliable indicator, unfortunately, like you like to think, oh, this, this location change means something, but actually when pe people are moving around, like, um, sometimes even just connecting to a Wi-Fi spot somewhere gets rooted in some really strange way on some infrastructure that means you see a big location change and then they switch back to 4G, you know, on their phone and then it suddenly comes from a different place. There's, when you start looking to location changes, it's, it's actually surprisingly false positive prone for things. So I think if you were using it as a potential detection control, then maybe you could just do that with the logs and, you know, in, in Entra and just look for uh, IP changes for a user, um, that are, you know, significant, like, and, and there's things like impossible travel controls of, I know my, certain Microsoft products have and other things like that. You could, you could look into that, but it's not going to be particularly high fidelity. Um, but yeah, we, we don't, with our product, at least we're not using location as, as part of what we do for session theft. We are doing it based on the, uh, the presence or absence of, of our session marker to mark that it's been removed from the device and used elsewhere. Cool. Great. Well, I think, uh, we we've run over now, so I think that's, that's about, um, all the time that we have. So apologies if we haven't uh, managed to answer your questions, but if you follow up, um, yeah, we'll be sure to, to, to get back to you. Thank you very much everybody who's attended and, and for all of your questions and thank you very much, Luke, for the, the presentation and, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see you next time.